Welcome to the University of Iowa, and thank you, uh, Bill, for setting the stage. Uh, I am honored to see everybody in the audience and to, to uh, see persons with whom we've, we've walked an emotional journey for a long time. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge the people in the lab who, as Bill said, are here today because they want to be here today. Their work is given meaning through your presence. They do it out of passion, they do it out of dedication, and they're all here for you. Um, what I'd like to do as I begin is to talk with you about the complement system, and some of this is very old information to some of you, so some of you could be up here giving the talk on the complement system. I'll also share with you and introduce to you some a new system, the coagulation system, and a new term, crosstalk. So systems in the body aren't isolated, they talk to each other. And in so talking to each other, that can provide to us new insights into a disease that you might feel we've solved. And in a very real sense, we've had a miraculous advance and there's a miraculous treatment, but there remain questions to be answered, there remain goals to be achieved, and that's why we're here and that's the basis and the foundation of the work that we do. And I won't introduce everybody in my lab because they're scattered around, but if you see somebody uh, from the University of Iowa, say hello to them, ask them if they can take you through the lab, you can see where all of this is done, and they'll tell you their story from the wet lab side and from the test tube side, and how your life is really a driving force in the work that they do. So, um, what I'd like to do today is to, first of all, provide an overview of the complement system. So that's the foundation that uh, you have to have to understand the, the basic pathogenesis of the disease, what drives atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. So I'll provide a review of what the complement system is, how the, the proteins in the complement system are made, when you first learn about atypical HUS and then when you first learn about the complement system, that's a huge pill to swallow and you think, gosh, it's just so complicated, there's no way I'll ever be able to understand it. And then I'll touch briefly on why it's called a cascade, what the amplification loop means, and what checks and balances are present to provide control in all of us, because in all of us, all the time, the complement system is constantly ticking over. So we call that process where it's constantly on at a little rate, at a low rate, tick over. And then I'll provide a brief overview of what happens in atypical HUS. And then I'll touch on future lines of study, things that our lab is dedicated to try and answer because we think that the questions that we are raising are important to you as families. And if there are other questions that you think we aren't touching on, by all means share those with us and we will tackle those as well. So what is the complement system? This is supposed to be a, a bacterium and so it's a protective system. It eats bacteria. And to eat bacteria, it decorates them with markers. And so something sticks on the bacteria, and the cells go around the body. And so that's a phagocyte. So that's a cell that eats other cells. And it has to know which cell to eat. And the cells that it eats have been marked. And so it eats the cell. <laughs> so that's the first thing that the complement system does. The second thing that it does is it recruits more cells to help out. So if you're having a battle and you have one cell against all these bacteria, 
you'll probably lose, and so you want to call in the cavalry. And so we have markers, and the two most important markers are called C C5A and C3A, and they make lots more little bits of C5A and C3A, and those signals throughout the body or at specific locations within the body call in not one cell, but lots of cells to help, eat, help out eating bacteria and help fighting infection. The other thing that it does is it blasts holes in bacteria and foreign cells, and in so doing, the cells leak, and when the cells leak, they die. And so the cell dies. Now, the complement system is very, very complicated, and so in understanding the complement system, if you understand a little bit about the history of the complement system, it's not nearly as complicated. And so, as you know, it's named, and they use the letter C, so there's a C1, and there's a C2, and there's a C3, but the order of activity within the complement system is not sequential. And the reason that it's not sequential is that those numbers after the C represent the order in which a protein was discovered, not the order in which it takes place in a reaction. And so C1 was the first protein discovered. The fourth protein discovered was C4, but that's the second protein in the reaction of the classical pathway. The second protein discovered was the third protein in the pathway, and then the third protein discovered was the fourth protein in the pathway, and so you can see as a consequence of the nomenclature, and then as a consequence of our increasing understanding of what's happening in the complement system, the whole thing gets kind of mixed up. From C5 on, those were discovered sequentially, and those are activated sequentially. And so this, I've shown you, is the order of the sequential reactions for the complement system through the classical pathway. And that's why the order of the sequential activity is different than the order of the sequential numbers of the proteins. We also have the alternative pathway, which is the pathway that you are all most familiar with or that you have all heard about. And in the alternative pathway, they did away with the C numbering. The alternative pathway is called alternative because it was discovered, it was recognized after the classical pathway. And so it was thought to be an alternative way to activate complement. And so they did away with the C's and the numbers, and instead they used letters. And we started with B. I don't know why we didn't start with A, but we started with B. And then there was D. We couldn't use C because C was already used. And so that's the alternative pathway. And then most recently there's been a third pathway that's called the lectin pathway, or the mannose binding lectin pathway, and that's named by the proteins, the enzyme constituents of that pathway called MASP1 for mannin binding serine protease 1 and MASP2. And after that, the pathway is the same as the classical pathway. So what about all those little letters that you see? Well, so by convention, when you have a big protein, it's cleaved or cut into little bits. And so when it's cut into little bits, the smaller of the little bits is designated by an A, and the bigger of the little bits is designated by a B. And then when B is cut, the bigger bit is a C, and then we go to D and G, and so on. So the small letters always represent a portion of the big letter before it, or the big letter and number before it. And so 
we know where these bits are coming from, their derivative protein, and that also, however, can make it difficult for us to figure out what's going on in the sense that when we are looking at C3C, so if we have a marker to identify this, oftentimes we cannot unambiguously say that we're just looking at this and we're not looking at any of this and we're not looking at this. So that adds a level of complexity for us in the lab when we try to figure out certain things what, about what's happening in atypical HUS. The other thing that's important is that in the blood you've had your C3 levels measured, you've had your factor H levels measured, you've had maybe your factor B level me measured, and in the blood some of these proteins, when they circulate, they are inactive. And the reason that they are inactive is because if they were active in the circulation, that could be bad for your body, and these proteins and the complement system could be destroying different parts of your body. And so the inactive proteins actually have a name. We call them zymogens. And sometimes what happens is their activity occurs either because they change shape or because they're cut. And more frequently, it's because they're cut. And so in this particular case, B is inactive. When it's cut, BB is able to now cut other proteins. And in particular, it's able to cut C3. And C3 is a name, a protein, with which you should be familiar uh, um, as it's integral to. So it's kind of the capstone, the keystone of the complement system. So why is it called a cascade? It's called a cascade because as we start, as it's initiated, and we move through the processes, and the process is the initiation or the beginning. The second process is the amplification or ramping up the signal. And the final terminating process is called the terminal pathway. As we go through that, the signal is, is uh, both amplified and it cascades down. And so we have the initiating pathway which now is one of three, which I've mentioned to you earlier, the alternative pathway, the classical pathway. This was discovered first. This was alternative to this and is so named and was discovered second. This was discovered third. And then we have this amplification process. And in the amplification process, you can see that I've drawn two circles together. One is C3 with a small b, and one is b with a small b, so we know and you know now that this comes from C3, and it was cut to make C3B. This comes from B, and it was cut to make BB. They stick together, and they are given a special name. They're called a C3 convertase. So they stick together, and instead of saying C3BBB all the time, we just call it C3 convertase, and they have a special property and that special property is that any C3 that they see in the circulation, they can cut it, they can cleave it to make another C3B molecule. And then we have the terminal pathway and the cascade of the terminal pathway ultimately giving us the ability to blow a hole in a bacteria and to kill the bacteria. So why is it called an amplification loop and where does the amplification come in? So it's called an amplification loop because there are huge, there are huge amounts of C3 in the circulation. There's a ton of C3. And so what happens is newly formed C3 convertase is created from the old C3 convertase. So that's the amplification process. And because it cuts C3, this is called C3 converting convertase. It converts C3 to C3B, hence the name convertase. When we take the C3 convertase and we add another C3B to it, which is easy to do because there's lots of C3B around, it's called a C5 convertase. It cuts 
It converts C5 to C5A and C5B, and C5B starts that cascade that I showed you and makes that molecule that blasts a hole into a bacteria. And so we might start out with one C3 convertase, but quickly we have tons of them. And that's the amplification process. So how do we put this all together? So I've shown you the different parts, and so now I'm going to show you something that looks complicated, but it's just made up of these small integral parts to try and put it all together for you. So we have the start. To start it, we have to initiate it through one of these three pathways. This was discovered first, this was discovered second, this was discovered third. This is of most interest to you. All of these pathways funnel into the C3 convertase, which I showed you earlier, and which provides the amplification process for this entire pathway. This amplification process is huge. 10 billion molecules of C3 convertase can be generated over the course of 15 minutes in any one of us. That's how important this system is in fighting infections and in keeping us healthy. And then we can make the C5 convertase. We can call up other cells. There's our C3A and our C5A calling in the cavalry so that we've got more people to help us out. There's the way they mark cells. So they mark a microbe, a bacterium, with a little signal so that the body can see that signal, can see that signpost, and knows that it's supposed to eat that cell and get it out of the way. And there it is, blasting holes. And so it's a complex system. It's made up of lots of parts. And this is how, basically, it is integrated together. And so you can imagine that with a complex system, there has to be some checks and balances, some breaks for this to work. And there have to be checks and balances both in what we call the fluid phase, so that's in your bloodstream, and checks and balances on the cell surface. And so that means on the cells within your body, because this system is somewhat indiscriminate. It doesn't know you from a bacteria other than by marking that bacteria to say, eat me. And so if it marks your cell and says, hey, attack this cell, you could end up with a disease. So what provides this control? There are a number of breaks in the system. So think of control as brakes, brakes in a car, so things don't get out of control. And there are several examples. And the example that you're all familiar with are fa is factor H, and maybe the factor H-related proteins. There's C3, uh, which is actually not, well, the other, another break is MCP that you're familiar with, and maybe, uh, maybe CR1. So how do the breaks work? So here's the complement system again. And so I'm going to get rid of all the extraneous stuff, and I'm going to leave you with the amplification loop. And so if you were going to stop complement activity, one of the things that you could attack, or you could try and break, or you could try and control, is this amplification process, because if you can stop the amplification process, then maybe you can stop the downstream consequence of it. And so that's actually what factor H does, and that's what these other, other uh, breaks do in various forms and various ways. So then what happens? So here's our bacteria. We don't want a bacteria in our body. The C3 convertase indiscriminately showers the bacteria and also our own cells. As a result, we have this amplification process that you are now familiar with. That leads to C5, which you're now familiar with. That leads to the terminal pathway cascade, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Bang, there's a hole in the cell, the cell dies and everything's fine. But remember, the attachment of C3B to cells is indiscriminate. It's a very reactive protein. It likes everything, so it sticks on your cells too. And in sticking on your cells, 
More C3 convertase sticks on your cells, so this is not looking good. But we have these regulators of complement activation. Here comes factor H, here comes factor I, here's CR1, here's MCP, here's DAF. These are the brakes, and they say, whoa, we're going to stop this right here and now, and everything's fine. So then what happens in atypical HUS? So this slide is identical to the slide that I showed you when this system is attacking a bacteria, but now it's your cell surface. So somehow, somehow the complement system is not recognizing you for who you are and is attacking your cells and causing damage. And so you could imagine, well, maybe the brakes don't work. If your brakes don't work in your car, you can't stop. If brakes don't work in the complement system, it can't stop. And so, as a result, the convertase, C3 convertase, that converts C3B, C3 to more C3B is not controlled. A C5 convertase forms, and we activate the terminal pathway, and we form membrane attack complex. So this is, I'm going to show you just two or three brief examples as, a, as examples of a general rule. And so um, this is factor H. And as all of you know, factor H is like a string of pearls. And there are 20 pearls on that string. And as Linda will tell you, the last five pearls are white. And they are the pearls where most of the errors are identified in the factor H protein in patients, in persons with atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. And because of those errors in the protein sequence, factor H as a break is not effective. It'd be like not having any brake fluid in your car or your, your uh, brakes don't work. And so then as a consequence, this activity continues unimpeded. And because it is unimpeded, you can damage cells in your own body. As a second example, I show MCP. So MCP is a little bit different because it has this little square here that call, is called a transmembrane domain. So MCP is stuck on your cells. Not all your cells, but most of your cells express MCP, whereas factor H is in the fluid phase. So factor H is kind of going around the, the, your bloodstream, kind of looking out for bacteria, and it's kind of there to make sure that your, your own cells aren't being damaged by the complement system, whereas MCP is actually attached to specific cells. And so in being attached to specific cells, it also provides control so your cells aren't damaged. And so the general composite overview is that if the brakes don't work at this level or at the MCP level, this system, the complement system, can continue unabated. And if it continues unabated, then that's bad. Now, I gave you an example of mutations or changes in the protein that make it ineffective and unable to work. But you could also block it. You could mask it. And this uh, Y is an antibody. So by convention, when we draw pictures of antibodies, we always represent them as the letter Y. And you can think of this as just a mask, as a sheet. It covers factor H, or it covers certain parts of factor H that are important for control. And in so doing, the body can't see that it's got factor H around. The factor H can't do its job. And if factor H can't do its job, then you've activated the complement system. And again, the complement system can damage your own cells in your own body. So over the last year, there was a new gene that was implicated in atypical HUS. And that's DGKE for diacylglycerol epsilon, uh, kinase epsilon. And it is an intracellular lipid kinase, so big deal. What does that mean? So <laughs> what it does is it 
takes this protein in its active form and it sticks a phosphate group on it. So it sticks this little tag on it. And as a, as a result of this tag, this protein, which was active, is now not active. So it's like a light switch. It turns off something. Now, if this light is turned on, when this light is turned on, it actually turns on another protein called PKC. That becomes active. And when that becomes active, we start making what we call thrombotic factors. So we start making clots. We start activating the coagulation system. So how is that possible? How come we have the coagulation system and the complement system interconnected? Well, think for a moment. Say you get an infection. Say you get your hand cut and you get some bacteria that come into that cut and you rev up the complement system, so the complement system's going to your hand and it's going to fight those bacteria. Wouldn't it make sense? Wouldn't it make sense to rev up the coagulation system? And so the coagulation system's going to make all these clots around this bacteria and it's going to trap the bacteria in this prison of clots and within that, co the, that confined space, the complement system can then attack the bacteria. And so the two systems talk to each other, and that's what I mean by crosstalk. And when you think about it, at an intuitive level, it makes sense, because if you wall off the bacteria, then you don't have to go search them all throughout the body. You know where they are. They're where the clot is, and you're going to direct your defensive immune system to taking care of problems in that location. And so this was the, an important discovery because this is a gene implicated in atypical HUS, the presence of which prevents too much clotting. So there's a relationship between clotting, coagulation, and complement, and all of that has some bearing on atypical HUS. So I'm going to provide you a brief overview of how that intuitive connection is forming a foundation for work that, that uh, people are doing in my lab that we hope will be pertinent to you and in, in answering your questions and your concerns that you have about atypical HUS. And so in so doing, I'm going to mention the thrombotic microangiopathy disease spectrum. And we've been talking about atypical HUS, but a kissing cousin of it is thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, which when you list the clinical features seems very identical with the exception that clinically we often think with TTP we have a fever and we have neurological symptoms and it's been associated with a diagnosis of low levels of, and now I'm introducing something else to you, ADAMTS13. So what is ADAMTS13? Well, ADAMTS13 is a gene that provides instructions, so it makes a protein that's important for blood clotting. So now I'm talking to you about the coagulation pathway and you thought today we were just going to talk about the complement system. And so this cuts another protein called von Willebrand factor into small bits and so it helps control, and so again we're talking about control, it helps control the coagulation system. And so normally what we have is these ultra-large von Willebrand factors, it looks like a giant slinky, and we have platelets, and we have Adam TS13, and Adam TS13 cuts this giant slinky into little bits, and by cutting it into little bits, everything's normal and things are under good control. If Adam TS13 can't cut those slinkies into little bits, you can imagine that with lots of slinkies around and platelets sticking to them, lots of stuff gets stuck in the bloodstream, and as a result, we end up getting a clot, and we end up getting thrombosis, and 
we've already mentioned that the coagulation system and the complement system talk to each other. So if they talk to each other, is there a relationship between this disease and this disease when I showed you that they look kind of similar other than the fever and the neurological symptoms that I associated with TTP? And so uh, we actually looked at this about a year ago and we took some patients with atypical HUS, 26 of them, and we studied their, uh, their coagulation activity and looked at this gene. We studied their complement activity and also did genetic screening. And long story short is if your Adam TS13 level is below this line, you have a clear cut by convention diagnosis of TTP. If your Adam TS13 level is above this line, your Adam TS13 level is normal. So it can be really low, you got TTP, it can be above that line, it's normal. If it's between these two lines, you don't have TTP, but your Adam TS13 level is not normal. So you have an abnormal Adam TS13 level, but it's not so abnormal that you would be given a clinical diagnosis of TTP. And what we find is if you just go through these bars, each one represents one patient with two different ways of testing it. Uh, so the reason we do two tests is because it enhances our sensitivity. And, and these tests are really, 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 really good at detecting essentially very low, low levels of Adam TS13 activity. And they're really, really, really good at telling you that it's normal but they're not really good at identifying people that fall in this window. But, and so hence, our, hence we wanted to kind of use two tests. You can see this person was in intermediate on both tests, as was this, as was this, this person on one test, this person on both tests. And in aggregate, in aggregate, about 60% of persons with atypical HUS had reduced Adam TS13 activity. So that suggests that when we talk about atypical HUS and when we talk about TTP and when we talk about the thrombotic microangiopathies, really there's a little bit of fuzziness in there. And really what we're talking about is a disease spectrum where there may be patients at either end of the rainbow, but there's also a lot of patients that fall in the middle. And so, what I want you to take away from this is that atypical HUS, we've made incredibly impressive and miraculous strides in our understanding of it. The availability of Eculizumab Solaris is miraculous and wonderful and life-saving. But our, the story continues, and the story continues and by continuing the story and looking at things like crosstalk, maybe we can help you in the next stage of your journey. We can provide an improved view and an improved definition of atypical HUS. We can look at the coagulation pathway, but in addition, and Boo will show you this, we're, talking, we're looking at another pathway. So we have massive databases now where we can identify select pathways that when Boo tells you, you'll think, oh, that's intuitive. Why did it take you guys to think of it? And, and then we can interrogate those pathways. And we can interrogate those pathways by taking any one of you and sequencing every one, every one of your 20,000 genes in the genome. And then Boo takes this tons of data and he looks for significant changes in select areas, and by being focused and selective, we can provide new insights. And so we can identify new genes that are involved in atypical HUS. And in so doing, we can suggest alternative targets, some of which may be non-complement mediated. And in so doing, we can provide to you perhaps alternatives for long-term therapy. I'm sure everybody in this room has thought, 
my God, I have a child with atypical HUS, but where did it come from? And then how come nobody else has got it in the family? And do they have a chance of getting it? And if they don't get it, and if grandma didn't get it, and grandma's 93 and she hasn't been sick day one in her life, how come? We all say, well, it's the environment, but all of us live in a pretty much a similar environment. So, it's, so, so I think saying it's environmental is a little bit short-sighted. And so we hope that this knowledge will also provide to us a better ability to help you <laughs> and to predict relative risk for getting a disease if you carry a specific mutation. So thank you for letting us be here today. <laughs>